Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the Selling Earnings Call for our year-end report 2020. This session will be divided into two parts. The first is the presentation by Selling CEO Erik Gatenholm and CFO Gusten Danielsson. After their presentation, we will move on to a Q&A session where I will be back with further instructions if you wish to participate. You can already by now use the live event Q&A to the right and post questions. Those questions will be released during the Q&A session. And by that, I will hand over to Eric. Thank you so much, Isabel. And uh, um, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time. I'm excited to um, uh, go through this earnings call with you today. Um, we are super excited for, for the Q5 and, and extremely thankful for the, um, the great work the entire team uh, has put in and also the confidence in all our investors and shareholders that have been with us uh, throughout this time period. So thank you so much for that. And, and with that, I'd say next, uh, next slide. So as, as Isabel mentioned during this earnings call, we'll be going through a little bit of the bioconvergence agenda, um, something that's been our driving force uh, for the last six months. Uh, we'll have a financial summary. We'll go through a little bit about the acquisition of Genolis, which is an important milestone um, in the bioconvergence agenda, uh, and, and a few other items leaving off with the Q&A session. You can go to the next slide. And you can go to the next one as well. So, so when it comes to uh, the bioconvergence agenda and the work that we are doing in, in, in this industry, we want to start by looking at the challenges. And today, the healthcare industry is faced by a few major challenges that are essentially driving the development, both from a pharmaceutical standpoint, but also from a medical device and biotech standpoint. Um, and if we're looking at the driving factors behind our growth and our a future development for the coming decades as a company, uh, we're looking at essentially, first of, first of all, the process of developing new medication and uh, pharmaceutical compounds is extremely complex. It takes a lot of time. And, and the fact is, it's very expensive. It can cost two to three billion dollars to develop just one new drug. And the fact is nine out of 10 of those drugs, they fail in the clinical stages. This is an indication that the, the pharmaceutical industry is in a major need of better platforms for testing uh, pharmaceutical compounds at an earlier stage. The next major challenge is, of course, that a, a life is lost every single hour of the day due to the lack of organ transplants. Um, and, and, the, and the fact is, there's a major lack of tissue in the uh, in both in the transplantations industry, but again, also the first point in the pharmaceutical industry. And lastly, animal studies are a very poor indication of the success of human drug development. And that ties also very nicely together, of course, with the first challenge where we're using animals to study and determine if a drug will fail or succeed in a clinical uh, in a clinical setting, meaning in humans. And it's been it's been proven uh, several times in the last co couple of years how yeah. animal studies are not good indicators of success for human clinical trials. So in these major healthcare challenges, you can go to the next slide, uh, we see ourselves working in, in, in combining a wide range of technology areas and wide range of, of fields um, <clears throat> to create essentially this bioconvergence concept, which we believe is the future of healthcare. Um, so, so the question is then, what is bioconvergence? You can go to the next slide. So bioconvergence is really um, a, a combination and converging of a few different uh, disciplines in the field of biology, uh, robotics, uh, mega trends such as genomics, proteomics, uh, AI, machine learning, and big data. And what we believe here is that for the next coming decades to answer major healthcare questions such as cancer, diabetes, uh, we need to combine a lot of different technologies. Cellink was started as a bioprinting company about five years ago. And at that point, we understood that bioprinting is an extremely powerful tool. Bioprinting will change the world of medicine by providing on-demand human tissues that can be used for drug screening, drug development, and in fact, reduce the use of animal trials 
Um, and of course, in the future and coming decades, be a source of, of tissue for implantation purposes. But we also understood from the fact that we spent a lot of time with our customers uh, learning from them that bioprinting itself is not going to make that impact unless it's combined with complementary technology platforms. So over the last couple of years, we've learned that bioprinting uh, combined with, for instance, genomics, combined with artificial intelligence, microscopy, uh, and, and novel material sciences has really the impact to, to make the change that we want it to. You can go to the next slide. So, so that has been our driving agenda forward for the last couple of years. And, and that's where it comes into the question of, you know, what is our agenda moving forward? So looking at our agenda moving forward, um, we, we see ourselves uh, we see ourselves working very strongly in the field. So, for instance, drug discovery, we're working on regenerative medicine, CRISPR gene editing, and these are potential uh, expansion areas for us moving forward. Uh, I know we've been talking a lot about uh, mergers and acquisitions. We've been talking a lot about our strategy for it, and I think it's important to mention here that our strategy as a company is not to acquire companies. We are not an acquisition engine that is driving to just find the next acquisition target. What our goal on this planet is, is to drive the bioconvergence agenda, combine novel technologies that will impact healthcare and solve these major challenges like cancer, diabetes, and the lack of organs. And then the question becomes, how do we do that? Well, one way is to do a very aggressive R&D agenda, to develop the greatest technologies beyond the cutting edge of science, Another way of doing that could be to acquire companies, because for us, it's all about getting into those areas the fastest and having the largest impact on the market, gaining most market shares. So sometimes in certain areas, it's all about acquiring business quickly, helping those companies grow and getting access to those technologies. And sometimes it's about uh, in-house R&D that is the successful and the fastest route forward to our strategy. You can go to the next slide. So looking at our, our uh, looking at our, our business today, um, our structure is essentially uh, we're structured in essentially three business areas, and these main business areas is first of all bioprinting, which comes from the core uh, uh, introduction of selling. Uh, we have biosciences, and we have industrial solutions. And something I want to guide you to is looking at the bottom of these 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 circles and how these interconnected circles are working. Well, the first one is disease and tissue modeling. Uh, our bioprinting business area is all about producing diseases and tissue models. So it's printing human tissues that can be used for pharmaceutical development, uh, get can be used for cosmetic product development, and then in the future for, for implantation purposes and for tissue repair. And in this business area, we have our, our innovative BioX platforms, our holographics, uh, Luminex, and many other complementary technologies. Um, in conjunction with that, once we have printed the tissue or we've printed the disease model, the next step is to do analysis of that model. So for us to really understand how a cancer tumor works and how it's affecting the patient, we have to look at the microscale. So we have to look at the single cell that drives that, that uh, uh, cancer tumor. And we have to look at the cancer tumor as a tissue. And how do we do that? Well, First of all, we have to sort that single cell out. So we have a lot of single cell sorting uh, uh, technologies. We have uh, technologies that can be used for cell line development. Uh, we have bioreactors for scale up of these, of these cells. Um, and we have a very strong single cell genomics workflow that can really enable uh, the sample preparation steps for, for essentially looking at the genetic composition of these, of these cells. Another step is, of course, doing live cell imaging of these printed tissues to understand the long-term effects of these drugs on human tissue. Uh, so, so the bioscience business is really all about disease and tissue analysis. And lastly, once we understand, once we can print the tissue, once we can analyze the tissue, well, then the last part becomes how do we diagnose the tissue? Because if we know how to cure a patient or if we know what will work on the patient, then it's all about being proactive to understand that patient's disease at an earlier stage. And that's when all the diagno diagnostics comes into play. And that's where our industrial solutions uh, technologies are really focusing on mainly today. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
Looking at the market, which is which is important, of course, from from a perspective of understanding where we are today and where we're anticipating to be in the next coming years and decades. Uh, first of all, our, our our total addressable market uh, today is about twenty four billion dollars, and we're focusing on industries industry such as single cell analysis. Uh, we're focusing on three D cell culturing and cell line development. Uh, in this industry, you see peers uh, or competitors that we call them out in the field. Um, uh, such as 10x Genomics or, or Berkeley Lights, uh, and these companies have been have been successful at growing their business from from the fact that they've they've uh, been able to develop innovative systems that can truly make an impact. However, we also see that their products are typically quite uh, exp uh, quite expensive and quite prohibitively priced, which gives us an opportunity to make a very good impact on the market with our products in our segments and also the fact that we can actually offer workflows that many of these companies can't. And that's really uh, the era that we're entering into right now. Um, the era of workflows, uh, workflow enables us to essentially couple together a wide range of technologies to get, get more insight and get into the customer's, um, uh, customer's work and also drive their development forward. So then, of course, looking looking forward and in, and into the future, we're looking at being able to offer products more for the bioprocessing and cell culturing industry, which is about a forty five billion dollar industry. Um, and and of course, the single cell analysis and the three D cell culturing those are sub parts of that of that major industry. And all combined, this is part of a bigger picture, which is about a two hundred billion dollar market uh, that we see ourselves being able to lead in in the next coming decades. You can go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned, it's it's all about the workflows and uh, uh, looking at a customer's workflow. This could be one of the examples, especially for for drug screening uh, or drug development, where the customer would start by printing single cells, sorting these cells into into uh, into well plates, expanding and growing these cells so that you know you're at, you're starting with exactly this the right cell type. Then you're mixing those cells into a bio ink, printing out those tissues. Uh, with our liquid handling robots and systems, you're dispensing different molecules and compounds onto those tissues, and then you're imaging these tissues using a, our live cell imaging products. Now, this workflow is something that we can do a plug and play at a lot of different pharmaceutical and biotech companies around the world. Uh, but uh, there's been a there's been a missing um, piece to this workflow, and that's been really the integration or the architecture that brings all of this together, which is something very exciting that we'll be talking about a little bit later in this presentation. It has to do with the with the latest acquisition of, of Genoldis. You can go to the next slide. With that, I'll leave off to you guys then. Thank you, Eric. So, of course, it's a great pleasure for the two of us here to present our greatest quarter so far, I'd say. We've uh, had a very strong quarter in terms of uh, the growth we've showed, shown during the end of this year. Important here to notice uh, before we go into the details is that this is our first and only fifth quarter that we're going to introduce to all of you. So we're now converted from a broken year into a calendar year, and we did this by extending our year to 16 months a year, which means that the Q5 is four months. In, in terms of enabling in, a, to, in order to be able to compare this with previous numbers with the numbers you'll see as in the corresponding um, year is also four months period last year. With that said, we reached an, a record breaking 239 million crowns of, uh, top, of net sales in the quarter. This was up from about 50 million last year, corresponding to growth of about 377% which uh, a lot of that growth is of course from our acquisition of sand and that we did during the fourth quarter last year that was has been incorporated from the first of september meaning the full quarter of this year uh, of, of this period what's even more um, pleasing for us to see is that the development of our traditional business the business we had prior to acquisition has been growing very steadily and uh, in the fifth quarter reaching 73 percent organic growth during this period what we see if we look in deeper to the numbers is that we have growth all across our product portfolio during the year we've had challenges especially with 
products that are strong in the academic sector where we where we've seen that more academic labs have been closed down than our pharmaceutical uh, customers and this is something that's impacted our growth all across this uh, this year when we've during this pandemic but in the fifth quarter we did see some uh, more of these uh, customers opening up uh, taking or uh, placing orders and accepting them for delivery into the labs and this is the reason why we've been able to see see and show higher organic growth in the fifth quarter versus previous quarter this year. This um, this is also up from last year where we had 47% growth in the same period last year, which is of course pleasing to see is the profitability in the quarter. We have a financial target which says that we want to grow with at least 35% organically year on year and on top of that through acquisitions. Um, and in addition to that, we have a financial target saying that we want to do this while maintaining a positive EBITDA margin. The last few quarters we've had negative EBITDA margin and now in the fifth quarter we have broken even and we're now uh, we, we're showing 40 million crowns in EBITDA in the quarter corresponding to about 17 percent EBITDA margin. The reasons behind this are both seasonality where we see that especially cyanin has a very strong end of the year where you see a, a large portion of the sales coming through in, in the last three four months of the year as well as a big portion of the profitability are corresponding to that period of the year. So I wouldn't extrapolate these numbers into to seeing that this is something we, we would expect to see every quarter in terms of profitability. And this is also something where sometimes when we grow fast uh, in, in a quarter, it's the balance here is we're trying to grow the organization as fast as we can, but when the growth is faster than we can build the organization, we will be prof more profitable some quarters compared with others. This meaning is that we will maintain our financial target of achieving a positive EBITDA margin, but we're not trying to maximize our profitability at this stage rather than maximizing our organic growth and doing this while maintaining a positive EBITDA margin. In the quarter, we also showed a positive EBIT as well as all the way down to earnings and we had about 13.1 million uh, crowns uh, versus 18 million negative last year in the same period. This corresponds to about the 26, uh, 26 crowns uh, earnings per, per share in the fifth quarter. If you look a little bit on the rolling 12 months net sales from consumables, this has increased quite significantly in absolute terms, now reaching 35 million crowns in revenue from consumables. This is driven both by the acquisition as well as continued growth in the underlying business and, and you know, that we have in, in the group. What we've seen during the whole year and especially or still in the fifth quarter is that lab closures and activities down, meaning that we see less consumable usage and, and, and purchases of these consumables during the period, meaning that in relation to our total sales, this is still increasing from previous periods and we're now at about 12 we're, we're now at about 11.9 percent of our product revenue stems from consumable revenue this is something we'll see as long as the lab closures continues and we anticipate when labs are more active spe specifically when our academic labs are back in in the labs working with these instrumentations this will hopefully uh, grow faster than our product sales we can go to the next slide so in this one, in this slide, we're broken down the numbers a little bit more. We have now two segments in our accounting, which we haven't had before. We are showing the net sales for laboratory solutions, which is basically the old selling. Here we include selling Satina and Dispendix. Uh, this amounted to 87 million crowns of net sales in the quarter, which was where we where we saw the more than 70% growth or 73% uh, organic growth. In addition to that, we now had the industrial solutions segment here, which is the cyan and acquisition. This amounted to 152 million crowns um, in, in the quarter, which was, of course, a very strong ending of the year. There was a couple of different factors that contributed to this. First off, the, we had a lot of customers placing orders and a lot of uh, deliveries taking place in the fifth quarter, where the team at cyan and in operations there has been doing an excellent work to getting these systems out to customers in order to help out with, with their projects. We also have some contribution from COVID applications here, meaning that Cyanion are contract manufacturing COVID tests for some of their customers that just don't have enough capacity and can't build the platforms fast enough. 
where we then are producing some of these uh, COVID tests in-house on our solution, on our, on our instrumentation. If you want to dig in deeper to this, you can look at under the notes where you'll see the service revenue stemming uh, in the group. I want to also uh, point out that all that service revenue is not related to these COVID applications. Since we do have contract manufacturing for a, a wide range of different uh, applications. So this is something that will continue even if we don't have any manufacturing for, for COVID tests in Cyanian. The, what you see also, we, we show in the segment the gross margin on these uh, two different segments. Uh, it's very similar across the, the whole group in terms of the gross margin structure. And what's pleasing to see is the gross margin is now up at more historical levels compared with previous quarters. And the reason for this is both that we now don't have any significant sales in terms of uh, what we call sanitizing business as we've had in the, some of the previous quarters and also that we we see improved uh, pricing in the pricing power in the market for our products during the whole year as, for, as well as during q5 we've had a headwind in terms of currencies which is affecting our gross margin here where we see that we're pricing all our products in us dollars and euros and we have majority of our costs still in swedish crowns meaning that our gross margins are decreasing as the swedish crown has strengthened over the year um, the last thing I want to point out in this slide before moving forward is our net debt, net cash position, where we had about 750 million uh, crowns in net cash going into the first quarter here of the year. Since we've, of course, acquired Genolis, which will have an effect here in, in Q1 on our net cash position. And we'll get more back to those uh, details a little bit, little bit later. One last thing I'd like to point out before going to the next slide here is the Genolis transaction will be included in what we call the industrial solutions segment in our first in, in our Q1 and are anticipated to be included from 1st of March. In the next slide here, we are showing our rolling 12 months uh, net sales in the group. So what you see here is during the fifth quarter, meaning the calendar year of 2020 now, reached over 360 million crowns of sales um, with over 73 percent organic growth and all these uh, charts looks a little bit strange because of the significant both uh, organic growth as well as strategic or acquired growth that we have achieved during the fifth quarter um, but shows you some of the development we've had over the year we can go to the next slide we were touching upon the gross margin in, in the quarter and what we've seen over the past year is that we've had a decrease in gross margin from a peak at about 80% about a year ago or, or more here uh, down to about at the bottom here in last quarter. I think we were somewhere at 66% gross margin now over 70% again. Um, you know, looking at our business model, we have higher gross margins in the consumable segment of our sales versus the instrumentation. But really what, what I'd like to point out and show is the profitability of the business are not dependent on increasing gross margins in terms of the product mix, rather than when we increase the portion of sales stemming from consumables, this is not driving OPEX in the same way as sales of instrumentation are doing and that's really where we'll see conversion into a more high margin business in the future we can go to the next slide so if we're looking a little bit at the revenue from consumables we've had a steady increase in sales of consumables and as you can see cyanin has a quite similar structure in terms of sales on product versus consumables it's slightly lower than the rest of the selling group but instead they also have higher revenue from services versus the rest of the group where they are um, somewhere around 20 percent of the revenue stem from services in the fifth quarter what we see here now is that we've declined from about 14 percent of our revenue of the product revenue stemming from consumables in the third quarter down to about 12 percent now and the driver here is really the lab closures. And as soon as this opens up, we will see a change here. What we see today is that we have customers accepting their deliveries of instrumentations, but they ask us to hold off, for instance, BioInk orders in, in order because they have a best shelf life. So they don't want that to expire before they can use these in their labs. 
we can go to the next slide. In the fifth quarter, we see continued strong growth in our North American region. We have 143% year on year growth, and that's now about 50% of our market, uh, our sales stem from that market. This is very similar to the fourth quarter where we, we showed very similar numbers. Um, we have succeeded very well with our direct force, uh, direct sales force in the US, and they've all across the product portfolio from bioprinting into biosciences is been performing very, very well in the US. We've had a strong growth in the sample preparation equipment in the US compared with Europe, which has been part of the driver, the difference in the sales between Europe and North America, where we've been able to sell more, for instance, IDOT systems in the US versus Europe. We also see uh, decent organic growth in Europe, about 30%, but clearly lagging behind both Asia and North America. We've uh, communicated about the transition into direct sales force in Europe for, for about a year now, and this is something uh, we're continuously working on and we're implementing the same organization structure in Europe as we have in North America, and we're starting to see this paying off. So we have good hopes for Europe to pick up pace in relation to the rest of the world in the next few quarters. Um, in terms of other rev other areas here, this is fluctuating heavily depending. It's a very small number, so that's why we have a negative number there. And Asia is performing quite strong during the fifth quarter here as well. We can go to the next slide. So getting back a little bit to our long term financial targets and goals here. Well, we are focusing on organic growth. And as Eric mentioned previously, we when we look at our business and what we want to achieve, we're looking we have a very customer centric view of this. How can we improve the value, uh, the value proposition for our for our customers? And our go to is to develop these products ourselves, finding different ways of offering this to our customers. However, from time to time, we find that there's a better way of reaching our customers through M&A, and that's when we also have why we also have a goal of adding on additional revenue on top of the organic growth through transactions. Um, with that, we'll go to the next segment. Great, thank you so much for that, Gustav. So. Uh, I want to spend a few few minutes on the acquisition of Genolis. Uh, so the transaction in brief, uh, it was a transaction of about 70 million euro. Um, there was a we followed the uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, the the previous model of combining cash with uh, with shares, which is a a successful model that we have applied in the past. And really, the reason why we're doing that is because we want to maintain some kind of long term. Uh, long-term commitment from from management and long-term commitment from the previous owners to to stay with the companies for as long as as possible. It's an important step in our acquisition agenda if, um, when we do acquire companies. Um, and of course, looking at and how this company fits into our into our portfolio, uh, we have a few different models and a few different areas that we will fit in nicely through synergies, uh, and we'll talk through them now on the next slide. So, so uh, uh, firstly, of course, the uh, the Genolis platform. It's called Santia. It has a very innovative modular uh, modular aspect to it, where you can actually combine uh, a wide range of robotics and a wide range of our products from the portfolio uh, into this modular design. So, um, one example is we're going to offer a a modular, but the first of its kind, essentially tissue manufacturing workflow. Um, where the customer can choose a bioprinter, a large uh, liquid volume dispenser, an incubator, a microscope, etc., all coupled together into one workflow. We see this being possible really thanks to the fact that that Genolis uh, modular robotics platform is so well constructed and, and, and designed in a way that it can really enable these, these uh, synergies. Uh, the second one is, of course, uh, due to the due to the increased demand of microfluidics and, and lateral flow IVD tests, um, it's a it's a driving under underlying factor for us in terms of continue our expansion for Cyanian and also in industrial solutions uh, side. Um, during uh, Q5 and also uh, parts of of 2020, Cyanian uh, did a great commitment to providing systems for manufacturing of COVID tests. And we've seen that that's also something that that uh, Genolis has done and will continue to do. So we're excited to uh, be part of that. It feels good to be able to provide uh, products and and uh, and technologies that can truly make an impact on the healthcare industry today. 
Um, and, and then, of course, lastly, really what we were talking about previously on the slides, uh, the era of workflows. Well, you know, you know, this modular platform is an enabler. It will enable us to really couple together a wide range of products within our portfolios uh, in an integration manner so that we can have a, a, a more combined offering all under one software. You can go to the next slide, please. So, so as I mentioned, uh, the main synergies that we see are really with um, um, with the bioprinting systems, but also with the industrial systems expansion. And it gives us the capacity now to offer our farm and biotech customers something more reproducible. Um, over the last couple of quarters, we made a commitment, and this was a strong commitment from everyone at, in the selling group, to continue to push our products forward to the uh, uh, to the farm and biotech industry. And this is a commitment for that to increase the reproducibility and also the high throughput. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Santia platform, it fits really well with the Cyanian, uh, Cyanian footprint and their product portfolio where you can both develop multiplex assays, medical devices, and lateral floor IVD tests, but also manufacture them manufacture them in down, downstream for, for, for these customers. You can go to the next slide. Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, so, so as I mentioned also on the bioprinting flow, really have a combined, uh, combined modular unit everything from from the start of the tissue manufacturing, uh, printing the tissues in high throughput, analyzing that tissue, feeding that tissue, and then dispensing different compounds on that tissue and then and then understanding the uh, the effects and efficacy of these compounds. You can go to the next slide, please. In terms of the integration strategy, and I'll go over this quite quite quickly, but something that we've learned over the last couple of years and through the past acquisition is that it's really important to have a, a strong plan in place on how we will integrate these companies. Um, it's, it's a testament to how we acquire companies. I think the growth uh, that we managed to do in Q5 and the great result that we were uh, fortunate to show uh, was really a testament to how we integrate companies and that we can do that successfully. So the first thing is, of course, we develop a very strong 100-day plan uh, with the business area manager. In the ca this case, this is Holger, uh, and and support the uh, uh, the group executive team, but also, of course, support the executive team within the acquired entity. Uh, do strong onboarding activities where where the Genolis, uh team members and colleagues get an opportunity to to work strongly with the selling family and, and the selling group. And where we have these strong synergies, they will be implemented in the next coming six to 12 months. It's important to also look at, of course, the commercial capabilities that we can that we can do together as a team. Uh, the transaction is not one-sided, it's of course two-sided, where selling both get, gets added capabilities in terms of robotics and modularity, but you know, also, also get access to large distribution channels, larger uh, sales networks, and the ability to scale up their operations department with our manufacturing, both in Berlin, Gothenburg, and perhaps also in the US. You can go to the next slide. So looking a little bit on our historic transactions, we've shown this a couple of times before, but what I want to bring your attention to is the last bullet point uh, here on these three transactions, where we don't necessarily think we can acquire businesses cheaper than anyone else. We believe that we can show we want to show you how synergistic this transaction has been for us. The spendings we acquired about 11 times revenue two years ago, they're now at approximately one times revenue in relation to that transaction size. And this has been able, we've been able to achieve this really to when while we integrated them into our workflows and to our global sales team and marketing, being able to put the systems next to other systems in the group and really increasing the value offering for our customers. Same thing here with Satina. We acquired them a year and a half ago at about seven times revenue. Now they're somewhere between three and five times revenue in just one and a half year. They've really done an excellent job in Satina and being able to utilize the resources in the group and integrate their solution into workflows, especially with the Spendix and other instrumentations in the bioscience business area. I'll just mention Cyanian that we acquired in, in August, September here. We acquired them at about 3.7 times sales and now with the latest report update here, that's at about 2.7. And of course, the majority of that is not a selling effect rather than the uh, performance of the team at Cyan, which has been extraordinary. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and I think we'll skip all the way down to, uh, to uh, selling outlook 2021.
So uh, to round off before we open up for an M&A uh, for a Q and A session here, uh, Eric, do you want to go through that look? Gladly. So so with that, of course, first of all, thank you so much for for listening in, and thank you so much to our, all our team members around the world. We're super proud of everybody today. Uh, there's been a lot of great work that gone into Q5, uh, and important to mention is of course that. Uh, we will continue this strong growth agenda moving forward with our financial targets set at, at uh, 35% organic growth, uh, at least 35% organic growth in the coming years, uh, and also, of course, a positive EBITDA margin. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, it's important to, to reiterate this. Our strategy is not to uh, go out and acquire a lot of companies. Our strategy is to become the leading bioconvergence company on the planet that offers innovative solutions that can truly impact the healthcare industry. One way and method of doing that is by acquiring the latest and greatest technologies and integrating, integrating them successfully. Another way is through aggressive R&D agendas. So whichever way gets us there faster, we will proceed with. Um, but, but really our goal is to continue that bioconvergence growth and and build a very successful and healthy company. Right, so want to give the opportunity also to uh, everyone to put this date in the calendars. We're going to have our first Capital Markets Day on the 12th of May in conjunction with our release of our Q1 report. But this is in your calendars and we promise that you'll have uh, great fun learning about our technologies, listening to customers and uh, R&D leaders in order to understand uh, our technology better. And with that, I think we'll open up for a Q&A session. Yes, that's correct. Uh, now let's wrap up this session with the Q&A. And if you join online, you can use the live event Q&A to the right and post questions. And uh, we will publish them and Eric and Gustav will address. If you're calling in, you can ask questions directly to the speakers. Uh, we have had a few participants who are addressed that they would like to ask questions. We will begin with Ulrik Tatne from Carnegie. Please go ahead, Ulrik, and you do so by unmute yourself by pressing star and six. There might Thank be a you slight very much. Delay here. Yeah, hopefully um, you can hear me all right. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, Gustin and Eric. I know you're guys in Boston, so perhaps it's it's good morning and congratulations on this stellar quarter that you had. Uh, but if you can help me out, please, uh, with sort of the, both the sort of the Cyanion development in, in Q4. I know when you acquired a company, we were looking at flat, uh, flat this year on year growth for, for Cyanion, the expectations for, for 2020. So how has that developed sort of if you're looking out for the full year of, of Cyanion and what should we expect going into 2021? I think if you look at the performance of Cyanion in the fifth quarter, it's there, there is a significant seasonality to this that the end of the year is, is stronger, uh, both in terms of revenue as well as in profitability. I think a large portion of their EBTA generation is in the end of the year. And um, this is in the fact we, we, we do believe we'll see in the next uh, year here in 2021 too. Um, other than that, we, we don't see that there's any differences in the outlook we have on the business of Sanyo from when we announced the deal. Uh, we said that they should be able to grow in line with our financial targets. Uh, that's that's great, uh, and obviously we're seeing some some growth across well for the base base business of of Stalink, which is is great. So would you call it out sort of any specific systems? Is it the IDOT system or the single cell dispenser that is driving the organic growth? And I know that you have introduced some some new systems uh, from Cytina in in recent times. So suggest so your your thoughts and prospects of that going into 2021 as well. Great question. So, so I think from from that perspective, we see a a, a great growth opportunity opportunity from uh, both the Upsite, which was recently launched. I mean, competing with with uh, product offerings from companies such as as Berkeley Lights and a few other players in the cell line development field. Um, we see that the the Upsite is being a very very competitive platform. Um, it has the benefits, but it doesn't have the bulky size, uh, and and it has the capacity to be um, to be implemented in multiple different laboratories due to its fact that it's actually 
uh, democratizing the technology and ability for the researchers to work with us. So, uh, so from that perspective, we see tremendous growth in the future from our cell and development products, uh, also from our, our single cell genomics workflows with the IDOT, of course, as a star product. Uh, but what's most important to mention here is the combination of the different systems. So, so again, bioprinting itself, if we take that example, uh, that, that technology is making an impact, but it's not going to make the size of the impact that we wanted to unless we start combining it with, with complementary technologies. And that's what we're going to be doing with, with the IDOT and with the upside as well, um, either by building it and integrating into the robotic systems of Genolis uh, or by building um, uh, other workflows around it. And just a small comment in terms of the where the revenue growth comes from. I think during the, the first 12 months of this year, we, we saw a significant revenue contribution from the spendix as they were growing during the pandemic. Um, meanwhile, in the fifth quarter, I, I'd say we saw more of a recovery on the bioprinting, which had quite significant organic growth in the quarter, performing uh, better than anticipated from, from our side. So it was, it was growth all across the product offering. And great. And and just sort of on the new product offering, because I noted also as well from, from Cytina that a new product is launched within um, the microbiology field and printing of bacteria. Uh, it seems like a quite interesting product. So if you can just dilute a little bit more, because I believe that that is a completely new vertical for you guys. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, the upside has the capacity to, to, to work with microbial uh, microbial systems as well. But we, of course, we have the uh, the B site that has been operating within the, uh, the bacterial field or the microbial field. Um, the mi microbial industry is an interesting one, and, and we haven't had our foot in it uh, as strongly uh, previously, uh, but we see, of course, potential growth um, in, in that industry going forward with, with the bioprocessing products that we offer, the, the, uh, uh, both the Seabird, uh, but also the, uh, um, the bioreactors that, that we've been offering with, uh, through our partnerships. Um, so, so, so definitely the microbial field is an interesting one. It hasn't been on our radar as much. I, I have to admit that. So, so our focus is really on, on, on mammalian cells and working with mammalian systems to start with. Great, thanks. And uh, just a few questions on this uh, genolic, ac uh, genolic acquisition. Uh, we haven't been provided with that much information on sort of the margin profile of the company as well as how the dilution factor will be as it's part paid with shares. So you can just start off with sort of the margin profile of, of Genolis. Uh, would you call it out to be sort of a creative or on par gross margin wise as uh, rest of the group? And in terms of, of dilution, at what price will, will the shares be transferred and what type of dilution should we calculate? So in terms of the, the margin structure of Genolis, it's, uh, it's in line with the gross margin of uh, the rest of the business, I'd say. It's not going to improve our gross margin, but you're not going to see any significant changes either uh, due to the transaction. Um, in, in terms of the transaction payments here, we were paying the enterprise value 70 million euros. 60% is paid in cash. The 40% that are paid in shares um, is based on the volume weighted average price during a specific period. And we will announce those specifics in, in conjunction with closing. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, close to or around where we are today. And um, that's what you should be used when you calculate this. Great, thanks. Um, and, and just uh, a few accounts and questions before I go back into the queue and I'll let someone else answer, ask the question. Uh, so just looking at the capitalized R&D and, and the high depreciation rates in the fifth quarter, um, as well as sort of the, the cash flow, uh, could you shed some more light on that? Obviously quite a substantial part of the R&D is, is capitalized R&D and, and that is quite tied to depreciation, I guess. Uh, as well as to the cash flow, but could you provide us with a little bit more insight to to the capitalized R&D and, and the depreciation rate? Yeah, the depreciation here, while that's increasing quite significantly, is mainly due to the transactions. So when we do 
even if we're using IFRS, you know, when we buy a company, we do purchase price allocation and you can see the preliminary one in the report uh, in the end of the report where we allocate the asset, the, the purchase price to different assets that we then start writing off. So basically all immaterial assets and so on that we we are identifying, we write off for, or during a specific period of time. So a lot of our depreciation is connected to our acquisitions. And then, of course, we are capitalizing R&D in the quarter. We capitalized about 20 million crowns worth of our uh, worth of R&D expenditures. This is, you know, in terms of our total um, investments into r and is it's quite a small portion of it. And um, over, you know, over the year, we're we're looking at um, in relation to what we're truly investing into R&D. It's not uh, that significant, uh, in my opinion. If you look at the cash flow conversion, yes, we're showing positive EBITDA and EBIT in the quarter, but cash flow I think was ne negative seven million operation operational cash flow. And um, this is uh, depending on where you have the cutoff date. Most of the, our sales come came in the end of the year, in the end of the quarter, uh, which means that uh, most of our revenue is in receivables by the end of the period, which is of course decreasing our, our free cash flow conversion here in in the quarter. And uh, that's something that will change over time. Great. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Eric and, and Gustav. And once thank again, you. congratulations on the stellar quarter. I'll get back into the, the queue and, and come back with further questions. Thanks. And now we've got a question from Richard Andersson from ABG. Please go ahead and unmute yourself by pressing star and six. I think we should go on because we'll receive the questions through the live event Q&A. So maybe Eric, you can address that and we can get back to Rickard later. Gladly. Yes. So, so yeah. we have from uh, from Brad from ABG, uh, has the organic growth rate fully recovered to pre-corona levels? If not, how should we understand the upside, please? Thanks, smiley face. Uh, I think that, you know, it's a very good question, Brad. Um, if, if we look at if we look at Q5, right, and we say, you know, are, are we on par with what we expected to do during a healthy year? I would say that it's 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 in rough numbers, right? Because we, of course, expect a lot more uh, during a normal year since since the end of the year is, is a very important period for for laboratory budgets, for, for end of year budgets and things like that. I would say that during the, the Q5, we have seen effects still from the corona pandemic, and, and we will continue to see uh, effects in the coming quarters forward. And and I know that's, that might perhaps not be the answer that we all want to hear, uh, but but quite frankly, we're still affected by the pandemic at this stage. And and I'm, I'm afraid that I, I won't be able to tell you uh, indicatively when we will get out of this, uh, but I'm hoping, of course, if, if if all goes well with with vaccination and everything, maybe conferences will start back again up in in, in the fall. Uh, but yes, for Q5, it, there was a, uh, a Corona effect uh, that was that was uh, especially on the on the laboratory solution side of our business. I can address the next question, which is also from Brad here. With the fullness of time, what do you see as being the product mix between instruments and consumables? Where today it is about 88 to 12 percent. Could this, for instance, be 50-50 in the future? And when? Um, yes. Today we're 12 percent. We do see it's it's going to take a long time before this is a significant part of our revenue because of our growth on the instrumentation. So as long as we're placing a lot of instruments, this is going to be the bulk of our revenue. And uh, when we reach a more mature state, this will increase in proportion to, to our business. If we can reach a 50-50 level in, in the long time perspective, I think it's possible. Um, I think, you know, we're not 80-20 kind of company, but it's more likely that we could reach something like 50-50 uh, in, the, in the long term. Okay, let's see if we can hear Rickard better this time. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Right, hopefully you, you guys can hear me now. Uh, yes, sorry we can that. hear you. Uh, 
Great, great. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, Eric, Gusman, and Isabel. Thank you for taking my questions. I'll keep myself short here. Uh, so congrats to another outstanding quarter. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask, so I, I saw a report out that indicated that the FDA has begun to recognize 3D bioprinting as an alternative for preclinical testing. However, I've been unable to verify this via publicly available documents or, or any publications. Uh, is there any substance to such claim? And can you talk perhaps a bit about the potential impact for, for selling if if something like that would, would pan out. Gladly. So so I was shared, uh, somebody shared uh, this report with me. This was a market report. Um, uh, it was also publicly shared on Twitter. Uh, this was a few weeks ago. And in that report, it was essentially stated or sourced FDA that had recognized bioprinting for, for, for certain preclinical um, development processes. And I think this is a, a bigger subject that, that is coming about. Now, I, I don't know if FDA has has uh, set any guidelines. Uh, we don't know if, if that is uh, something that they're preparing. What I can refer to is, is essentially a few years ago, I think in 2018, FDA did at least come out with guidelines for regular 3D printing. Uh, so it does take some time uh, for them to establish guidelines in new industries. And bioprinting is a very new industry. I, I can point you to the right direction because uh, just about a few days ago, there was a new report that came out, uh, and this report is from Karolinska Institute. This is a very, very nice report, uh, and it essentially talks about uh, new methods to replace animal trials. Um, we know that the EPA has been communicating a lot uh about the reduction of use of animals for cosmetic for cosmetic testing. We know that the European Union has been very strong on banning um, animals for, for cosmetic testing. And we're also seeing now a, a major movement in the Swedish industry on the market where we're essentially pushing this agenda forward. And, and, and quite frankly, as a company, we are, are strongly committed to and have always been very committed to reducing the use of animals for the development of pharmaceutical compounds and for cosmetical compounds. So the report is, it's unfortunately in Swedish, I have it here, it's, it's about 100 pages. Um, I don't know if you can see on the camera, uh, but we can send out a link or we can provide a, a, uh, a the title for it uh, after the call perhaps. And I really recommend you reading it because it, it does mention bioprinting in a few places, it does mention 3D cell culturing and a few different methods that, that will be alternatives to, to um, um, animal trials in the future. Great, I appreciate it, Eric. And, and pivoting a bit into cell line development, as far as I know, there's no official published methodology on how to demonstrate clonal assurance. Uh, is that underway and how high could the bar be set there? Do you have any estimates on, on the number of legacy cell lines out there that could require new and up-to-date practices? Uh, just sounds like a very interesting sort of opportunity for you guys. It's a very good question, and and uh, I, I don't have all the uh, answers to it, so I'm going to have to get back to you with the exact details on the scientific side. But what I can say that with the launch of the Upside, we have doubled down on our clonality, right? So the first systems, the F side, the B side, and the C side, uh, those those products were offering single clonality, which means that essentially when you're dispensing these single cells, you're taking a photo and 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 documenting that a cell was shot out. Well, uh, listening to our customers, which which is something that we we do very diligently, these customers came back and said, "Hey, you know what? It's great to see that these cells are shot out, but it would be even better if we could see that these cells land in each well, right? So that we know that these cells are placed in the right location." So, so the the brilliant engineers and team at Cytina they went back to work and they developed this amazing scanning technology, which essentially now takes an image of the cell as it being shot out from the cartridge. And then a picture of that cell is being scanned from the bottom, uh, showing that that cell has landed in the right location. So the double clonality is an important aspect for the industry and something that I know we're going to be pushing very strongly from the commercial side. We're seeing a great interest for the product already. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a testament to the great engineers and, and developers that have brought this to the market. Um, I wish I could tell you more about the specifics, but let me get back to you on that. Sounds great. And just a, just a final one for me, uh, please, if, if I may. Uh, on the European Salesforce, uh, can you talk a bit more about 
how that's coming along. And can you talk a bit more about the scale of that initiative in relation to your current commercial infrastructure in the in the region? Yeah. So, so in terms of the European sales force, I mean, that was a commitment that we that we went into about a year and a half ago. Uh, we went from having a pretty substantial distribution network all over Europe to deciding to open our own offices, locations and, and hire individuals to run the sales. And and it's it's paid off, especially during the pandemic. We've seen that our previous distributors and our previous uh, uh, our, our previous uh, uh, partners in that in that region. Uh, we see that uh, they've had a harder time of they where they perhaps reduced their presence while at the same time we've been able to focus on digital sales opportunities uh, and and communicate directly with customers during the pandemic i have to say it it's been vital for us to have a direct dialogue with our customers in europe in america and in the apac region we have been able to work directly with them because during the pandemic it's not as simple as just offering a product for their solution or for their need and then delivering it. It's an ongoing communication. It's understanding that they're not in their laboratories. It's understanding that they need deliveries of reagents two months later. It's understanding that, you know, the deliveries should be by DHL or it should be by FedEx because all other delivery methods are, are banned due to the pandemic. And having that dialogue, I know that it's, it's, it's rigorous and it's time consuming, but it's only possible to do that when you own the customer, when you have direct access to them. And that is what makes the direct sales channel so so successful, and which is why we've been able to show 143% of growth in America. I mean, that's because we're so close to the customer. And that's why we've been able to show continuous growth in Europe as well. To your question, the strategy for it is to continue to build that sales channel and, and to have a leading sales force, both in the biosciences, uh, in bioprinting, and also in industrial, industrial solutions uh, in Europe. Great, thanks a lot for that, and thank you for taking my questions. I'll, I'll get uh, back in the queue. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening in to this earnings call, and thank you for all the good questions. Our next report will be released, as Gustav said, on the 12th of May, and we will then also arrange our Digital Capital Markets Day. So have a great Thursday, everyone. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>